On Larry King Now, astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. I reserved space in there for letters that I have written. For example, I wrote a letter to NASA. Mm -hmm. No, not when I was a kid. I want to be an astronaut. No, I, I was born the same week NASA was founded. Hmm. And so when NASA turned 60, I wrote a letter to NASA and I tracked NASA's arc through the decades adjacent to mine. Plus, we don't know what dark matter is. We don't know what dark energy is. We don't know what was around before the beginning of the universe. We don't know how organic molecules coalesced to become self-replicating life. These are profound areas of ignorance, and that excites me. All next on Larry King Now. Hey, welcome to Larry King Now from New York City. I think we're over here on 3rd Avenue, the Hoi Polloi, under the window. I'm Dennis Miller, filling in for Larry today. And I'm with Larry's favorite interview, I'm told. And a good cat. I met him years ago. I want to welcome Neil deGrasse Tyson. He is an astrophysicist, science communicator, author, currently serves as director of the world-famous Hayden Planetarium here in New York City. He also hosts his radio and television shows, both called Star Talk on Sirius Radio and National Geographic Channel. His newest book is Letters from an Astrophysicist, and it's currently available online and in stores. What's up, Doc? Hey, feeling good. How, uh... The universe is fine. You guys gotta fix Earth. Well, <laughs> listen, Earth will... I, I got the universe, okay? <laughs> listen, here's my feeling. Set up a Mars colony, and how many days before it begins to replicate Earth behavior? <laughs> I think it'll echo it within a calendar week. That's a, I think it'll bust out into that, the same drag. That's a, a perceptive point because everyone says there's all these treaties for the peaceful use of outer space. And I'm thinking, if you can be peaceful in space, why can't you do that on Earth? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. believe you that this is going to play out. I, I, I often wonder what are we to do? There's, we have the survivalist hard drive, don't we? Don't we uh, how, how much do you defer? To Great the question. place you're at in lieu of your survival. The survivalist hard drive operates in the moment. I don't want to die now. It doesn't operate for 100 years from now or 200 years yes. from now. If I tell you I found an asteroid and it's going to take us out in 500 years, you say, let somebody else worry about it. So you're not thinking about the species. You're only thinking about your own, your own ass. And I don't know that that feels selfish. It feels in me. I, I don't know. It's it seems mean, woven it, into my DNA. Yeah, should, I should it, is it bad or is it just the reality of it? Yes. And and I can tell you, my access to people's sentiments like that came through the fact that I received these letters from people. Mm -hmm. It's angst. Someone said, you know, I heard the world's going to end in 2012, and it's a kid. The adults are saying, you remember the whole 2012 scare, or even the 2000 scare, the Y2K. Mm -hmm. They're people who, who are afraid. They don't want to die. And so who do they turn to? And I'm an astrophysicist. I have some sense of the universe. And so I get these letters from them mm -hmm. asking about how the universe matters in their lives, particularly people who are in search of meaning. Mm -hmm. Maybe they didn't get it from whatever else they did in their walks of, in their arc of life. And so... This is an intensely interpersonal collection, just for that reason. Yes. The reason that you started saying here, what, what, how is this going to end? Where, what does it all mean? What are we doing? Yes. So They I'm talk screaming. about not traveling the planet now. I've seen that come up lately, where people say we should cut down on our travel to preserve the flat planet. And I don't want to do a corollary on if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's there to hear it, does it exist? But if the planet is there and I can't ever go see it is is, is it, it really a planet to you? <laughs> well i'm just saying what, what is the definition of a planet yeah is so it? i think the the issue is not that we shouldn't travel is that we should find another way to travel that doesn't destroy the planet why why be defeatist about what it is you should or shouldn't do why not be inventive and innovative and in so doing you come up with solutions undreamt of by the previous generation thomas malthus who said who said population will outstrip food supply because population is growing exponentially and food is only growing arithmetically, so we'll all starve to death one day. And he had no idea that science would be brought to bear on animal and animal husbandry and plant crops. Yes. And so breakthroughs. They break, happen. <laughs> if things kept the way they were back in yes. 1780, whenever he wrote, yeah, we'd all be dead now. Yeah. But we have innovations. We have creative people who say, I don't want to die, so let me figure this out. We now have more food grown on less land 
by fewer people than ever in the history of civilization. Mm -hmm. The fact that people are starving in the world is not because there's not enough food. It's a distribution political problem. It's not because we're running out of food. I want to talk to you about science being settled. I, I oh. think that was a bad, I, I don't know, Gore to me as a civilian, uh, I, I think that was a bad play saying science is settled. He's being broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. so, so what you say is there are things that science has discovered that are objectively true. Now move on to the next problem, okay? You jump out this window, you will fall, and we know exactly the rate at which you will gain speed and likely what will happen to you when you hit the ground. There okay? was a suicide hotline Thank operator. You. <laughs> exactly. We had that soon. We got, we we got Newton. that. Newton's laws work. Okay, they don't all of a sudden stop working just because time moves on. So when you, in science, if you've done an experiment enough times, not just you, because you could be biased in your own laboratory, yes. but somebody else with using a different wall current, somebody who has a different belief system than you, if they, and they design a different set of uh, experiments to test the same idea, if you all get about the same yes. result. It's Rashomon. You, you, you got something there. And if you got something there, that's what becomes the objective truth. This is why science is so valuable and so important to the progress of civilization. So yes, there are settled scientific ob objective truths. On the frontier, nothing is settled. You go to a science conference, we're duking it out, people screaming, hooting and hollering, and yeah, because everyone is passionate. You can't do anything that long with no rewards without passion. <laughs> Scientists, you know, it's they're paid well, but not crazy well. I mean, well, I love that contentiousness. I love brilliant men locking antlers. I'm a little more worried when I read the back and forth between Phil Jones and and Michael Mann, those East Anglia memos. I, I, I know people, I bring that up and people chortle and they go, well, uh, you know, you're, you're over-interpreting those. These are things they didn't think were going to be seen, and quite frankly, they didn't resonate well when they talked about the climate, the temperatures right. so going down. And what two people say to each other is irrelevant. What matters is the peer-reviewed research results. And never is there 100% of all scientists who agree on anything. The good thing about science is that the player is irrelevant. What matters is the data. What matters is the consistency of results. So you look around and someone does an ice core through Greenland glaciers and they get some result about what the oxygen or CO2 was 100,000 years ago. Somebody does an ice core in Antarctica. They have nothing to do with each other except they're 12,000 miles apart. They're getting a similar answer. Oh my gosh. Oh, there's, there's, there's the migration patterns that are changing for insects for flying insects, oh my gosh, they're migrating earlier rather than later. And you put all this together, the, the botany, the biology, the geology, the, the atmospheric chemistry, the oceanic research, you put all that and all leaning in this direction right here. And if you're gonna lean this way, I hope you don't have power over legislation because that could be the beginning, the beginning of the end of our civilization. Well, listen, I still have a few quibbles about it, and I would encourage the climate uh, people out there, when you do eventually go to burn me at the stake, you might want to rethink that, because I'll put a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. <laughs> After the break, we get into Neil's new book, Letters from an Astrophysicist, and the most common question he gets, can science and religion coexist? All that and more with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Stay with us on the Larry King Network. Welcome back to Larry King Now, and we are with Neil deGrasse Tyson. He has a charming book called Letters from an Astrophysicist, where he answers uh, letters from people. I, I read a couple more during the break. I find it very cathartic. Um, I want to talk about faith and science. Now, mm -hmm. I... Uh, As you yes. correctly noted, it's a big... It, uh, it drives a lot of people to send me letters. And yes. so there's a big, quite a sampling of those exchanges in here, not only from... Uh, Christian people of Christian faith, but Muslim, there's, Jew, there's a, Jew, a letter from a Jewish woman who's trying to raise her kid, but the kid is in denial of the Torah, mm -hmm. and she, she's wondering what to do about that because she's sending him to Hebrew school, but it's not sticking, and he believes in science. And I, so there's a lot of angst yes. in the letters that I get through there. Um, I don't even know you're a man of science. I don't know your faith, but can the two coexist peaceably? Well, well they do empirically. So... What, in the West, about 40% of PhD level trained scientists would claim a personal God as part of their belief system. Mm -hmm. What I mean by personal God is a God who listens to their prayers, 
and they think about who is paying attention to them and their needs or wants or desires. So, and they can still publish productive science. So the, it's factually yes that they can coexist. But there's a caveat. If you're gonna dip into your Bible or any religious text and declare that you found something about the Bible that applies to the natural world and scientific methods get a different result, if, if you're a betting man, <laughs> you're not gonna bet on the scriptural interpretation, you're gonna go with the scientific result. The history of this exercise bears that out. So modern enlightened religious people are perfectly content saying, uh, my, my, my Bible, I use it for spiritual mm -hmm. fulfillment and enlightenment, not as a science textbook. And uh, Galileo is famous for saying, the Bible tells you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. Hmm. Well, I, I think of Galileo in this back in the 1600s. Uh, he, I guess he jumps on Copernicus's theory, yeah, theory yeah. of heliocentrism. The next thing you know, he ends up before a Catholic Inquisition <laughs> board. I'm wondering today, is some of the secular community turned into a latter-day uh, inquisition? Well, you can do that if what you're bringing forth does not have any evidence in support of it, and you want to make laws based on it. Think about what America is, America. But we are, uh, I hate to overuse the term melting pot, but look at how diverse we are as a country mm -hmm. with fully practicing fundamentalist Christians, atheists, Muslims, Jews, animists, the, the political space, we're all here. If you have a belief system that's not anchored in objectively true things, and you rise to power, and you make a law that derives from your belief system, now that law has to apply to people that don't share your belief system. Mm -hmm. that, what's, what is that? Whereas an objective truth, I've said this before, the good thing about science is true whether or not you believe in it. Okay, and of course I mean objectively established scientific truth, are true whether or not you believe in it. So if you're gonna base laws on something, why don't you start there? Because that applies to everybody. I got one here, yeah. one, one of the letters. Someone and by said, the way, the book is Neil deGrasse Tyson, Letters from an Astrophysicist. And I know uh, I'm looking at it as like a strunk and white elements of style, common sense. It is a- Oh, that's nice. Uh, I take that as a compliment. Yeah, right. it's a well, very, I'm just saying, I think there's wisdom to be found. Tell me about the specific th Yeah, so just one particular case. This is not, doesn't involve religion, but it involves a belief. Uh, someone wrote in and said very politely, uh, Dr. Tyson, do you think there could be a large hairy ape wandering the Pacific Northwest? Okay, so this is like code for together now, Bigfoot, mm -hmm. all right? So I said, well, you know, we think we've discovered all the large mammals. Mm -hmm. we, we think we have. There's some animals down bottom of the ocean. We can just, we, because we're not, we don't hang out there. Occasionally one shows up, there's a new one. Mm -hmm. Most of the animals we're discovering are much smaller yes. and much less. And plus I said, if it's, if it's an ape of any kind, it's a ma mammal and it reproduces sexually, so there's gotta be at least two of them. And if there's two of them and they're still around, there gotta be some babies. Yes. And, and if they're babies, then you gotta find poop somewhere. Yes. You don't need the animal, you just need evidence of the animal to, to convince people. So I said, I find it unlikely. And he writes back and says, for a scientist, I thought you'd be open-minded, but you are so closed-minded. And so he, got, then it turned out he was angry. Hmm. And I said, here's what you do. Try to spend more time finding the thing and dragging it into town square than trying to convince people that it exists in the absence of that evidence. Next, Neil deGrasse Tyson shares his experience trying to describe 9-11, plus what he thinks happens when we die. His new book is Letters from an Astrophysicist, and you're watching Larry King Now. Welcome back to Larry King Now. I'm Dennis Miller with Neil deGrasse Tyson. The book is Letters from an Astrophysicist. Are these all retorts to people who have sent you something? Oh. Or is there any preemptive oh. letters to the, <laughs> the public at large? Oh, uh, about 80%, 85% are one-on-one -on -one letters, but I reserved space in there for letters that I have written. For example, I wrote a letter to NASA. Mm -hmm. No, not when I was a kid, but I want to be an astronaut. No, I, I was born the same week NASA was founded. Hmm. And so when NASA turned 60, because I'm 60, I wrote a letter to NASA and I tracked NASA's arc through the decades adjacent to mine. Mm -hmm. So in the 60s, we're going to the moon, but I'm seeing people picket preventing my family from moving into an apartment complex mm. in the mid 1960s. So it's kind of turbulent initially, but then we rejoin towards the end. 
where NASA now actually looks like America in terms of the most decorated. In the day, they all looked the same. Yes. You could barely tell them apart. Yeah, and they had crew cuts. Things. Crew cuts at a time when long hair was in fashion, and they all came from the military at a time war was falling out of fashion. And so they were not talking to me. So there's a letter to NASA in there. I also have a letter I wrote September 12th, 2001. I lived they have? four blocks from ground zero. Oh, you did? Yes, and I watched it in front of me. Here's an experience. Ready? Um, this is a philosophical problem. If you experience something that is greater than anything in your life, yeah. it's hard to describe it because mm -hmm. you have nothing to compare it to, mm -hmm. right? There's no, oh, it's like this. Well, if it's not like anything, what are you gonna do? When the first tower collapsed, hmm. the sound was this deafening mixture of sound frequencies I had never in my life beheld. And I, it was, I, I could, the closest I think is like a train wreck, like in the old days. But look, you're, you're struggling for descriptors but, right now. <laughs> but what? All these years but, later. Wait, 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 so watch. So here, here's my point. When the second tower fell, I said to myself, I know what that is. That's oh, the sound of a 110 God. story building collapsing. God. Framing, you already had it. There, so I, I don't mean to make light of it. I'm just saying, no, no, in there is my I'm saying my that's letter. fascinating. You already had input. On I it. described that mental. Exercise ah. in my letter. It was a letter to family and colleagues who wondered. They knew I lived downtown. They wondered if I got out of it. And then I, I at the, the last letter in there is a letter to my father, which was in the form of a eulogy. It lost him a couple of years ago. Um, very principled person, and he was active in the civil rights movement. It kept me grounded. Here, here, here is the son, the astrophysicist. Because I've known I wanted to do this since I was nine, and just I, I learned a lot from him how to navigate people, places, institutions. He worked under Mayor Lindsay during the civil mm -hmm. rights movement. And you know something? If I slip this in here quickly. You don't have to ever slip anything <laughs> in about your father, man. Take your time. Yeah, yeah, no. So you don't read newspaper articles about things that don't happen, generally. Yes. Okay? So now watch. 1960s, turbulent decade. Yeah. In fact, the most turbulent decade in American culture since the Civil War a century earlier. 1968, the most bloody year in the most bloody decade, okay? All around, in Vietnam, back here, assassinated leaders, Martin Luther King, yes. Robert Kennedy, okay? Riots in Watts, in DC, in Cincinnati, in New York City, didn't have a riot. Hmm. The nation's largest city with one of the largest ghettos did not collapse in 1968. What an amazing uh, blessing your father laid on you. I'm wondering when you lose a precious North Star like that, and you say a scamp two years ago, what did it do to your perceptions of an afterlife? How were you before that? And did it make you after hope more or want more or think more there might be an afterlife? That's a great question. So there's actually a letter in there. Really? <laughs> someone, someone, <laughs> someone wrote in about uh, about just what happens after death. What does science say? Because he wants to think of a soul, and yes. the soul is preserved. And I said, I'm pretty much all in on the fact that um, I, I want to be buried, not cremated. Because mm -hmm. if you're buried, the energy content of your body, long developed by the flora and fauna that you've eaten your mm -hmm. whole life, if you're buried, that energy content gets returned to the earth. To the earth. I don't mean that just in a poetic way. Worms will eat, plant tap roots, and you feed flora and fauna the way you have dined upon flora and fauna your whole life. Mm -hmm. And for me, that is the cycle of life. And if you choose instead to be cremated, that's fine. Your energy contents of your body gets released as heat. It heats the air. The air will radiate to space. And your energy then scatters across the universe. For me, both are significant. Both are poetic. Mm -hmm. I'm getting goosebumps hearing about these letters. Neil deGrasse Tyson, letters from an astrophysicist. And in the future, when I see worms laying around and being so placid, I'll understand that they're just playing coy because they know, oddly, they have the final word on all this. After we croak, <laughs> they come into the box and launch on us. Who'd have thought it that they're the final arbiters? In our final moments with Neil, we'll be answering your questions from social media. Uh, the new book is Letters from an Astrophysicist, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Larry King now, Dennis Miller, right back.
Welcome back to Larry King Now. I'm Dennis Miller. We've been having a delightful chat with Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's the author of Letters from an Astrophysicist and an accumulation of letters he's received, a couple open letters to society at large. It's fascinating stuff, fascinating. Can't wait to read it. Um, let's see what the, the folks have to ask you. Loretta Copeland on the Larry King Now blog asks, what's the thing that you love most about being an astrophysicist? I like waking up in the morning completely ignorant of an entire frontier of research that I want to contribute to expand. We don't know what dark matter is. We don't know what dark energy is. We don't know what was around before the beginning of the universe. We don't know how organic molecules coalesced to become self-replicating life. These are profound areas of ignorance, and that excites me. Where do you look for that, though? <laughs> I know. What, I mean, you, you've got to do research for the rest of your life to find out the first step you have to take to look at that. It is. It, so, as a scientist, you learn to love the questions themselves. And in fact, I've taken that to a next limit. It's, these are the questions we even know to ask. Yes. The question that I want to know is the one that will arise only after we have answered these. Yes. Putting us, in a, putting us on, a, on a new vista, allowing parts of the universe to be pondered that we don't even know is there to ponder. You're yet. moving on, on down the road. You're, you're moving you're, on down you, the you've road. You've gotten into the antechamber where you know what question to ask, but you're not even into the main salon yet. There's an old there's an old saying: as the area of your knowledge grows, so too does the perimeter of your ignorance. Cortland Beale on Facebook: mm -hmm. How does the moon affect climate change? Hardly. Uh, yeah. The moon has tides. Yes. Well, so here, here's the biggest effect: um, full moon has bigger tides than other phases of the moon. If you have a hurricane going up the coast. They don't move very fast, 20 miles an hour or so. It takes more than a week, 10 days, two weeks, to go up the coast. Somebody's going to get hit with that hurricane during full moon or new moon high tide. Mm -hmm. And hurricanes have tide surges. So as glaciers melt, tide, um, ocean levels rise. It can rise just an inch. You don't even notice an inch, except in the tide surge. And that, that wall you built to keep your city dry on high, on high, on bad weather, gets breached by that one inch. And that's all it takes. The middle of your city is now connected to a semi-infinite quantity of ocean. And you flood the city. That's what happened here for Hurricane Sandy. Do you think New Orleans has a responsibility to rebuild parts of that city in a place that it's, it's just predictive? No. They, they so, will flood again. No, so the problem there is we all blame in Katrina Katrina was a Category 3 when it crossed New Orleans. It was People, the levee wall. Right? The levee! It was an engineering problem. we got to admit that, look in a mirror, yes. and say, we messed up. To conflate it with that storm, which was not... Correct. A, uh, it, that storm should have just been a, just, a, just another Category 3. Ryan Clark on Facebook asks, are you personally af what are you personally afraid of, and what about it makes it so scary to you? I'm going to take the really high road here. Yeah. I'm afraid of the resistance that I see in the world, in the United States especially, from informed advice given by scientists that will impact how we manage our own civilization. That scares me. What, what is science? Science is a way of learning what is objectively true. Abraham Lincoln in 1863, when he had other things on his plate at the time, signed into law the National Academy of Sciences, whose job it is to advise the president and Congress, the legislative branch, on laws and issues that relate to our health, well-being, and security. Every time I see movements in rejection of scientific consensus, I weep for the future of civilization. That's what scares me the most. I, uh, as you said earlier, when you expand your level of knowledge, you widen out the perimeter of your ignorance. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen down the road, but I'll bet you somewhere along the way, it won't be on a yellow legal pad anymore. It won't be on Einstein's chalkboard. It'll be on some handheld thing. I do believe there'll be another breakthrough that we can't see right now. I just do. That's, I, I, that's very hopeful. Um, but when science... What am I to do except be hopeful? <laughs> you can help. <laughs> I, uh, there, there are parts of it that I completely adhere to. There are other parts that I'm not all in on I don't yet. like hope. I mean, I want hope. We need hope, but I don't like it. 
intellectually, I don't like it because it is the tacit confession that you ran out of ideas and you're not actively trying to solve the problem. You're sitting there wondering if someone else will. That's what hope is to me. Well, I've If you're actually to... working on it, I that's am. not hope. I, I'm almost there. I got my thing. I went to Antarctica for a couple weeks. You did? Yes, Very I did. Cool. I went down south of the uh, circle. Yeah, I was down to 67th degree. I would have had to start hiking. I did as much anecdotal as I could. I'm fascinated mm -hmm. by it. So, But I'm not all in yet, and I... I'm sorry about that, but uh, that's just, uh, that's, all right. that's where it's at. At least I'm studying it. I'm trying. <laughs> Thanks to Neil deGrasse Tyson for joining me today in New York City. Make sure to pick up his personal and informative new book, Letters from an Astrophysicist, currently available in stores and online. And a little plug for me, you can listen to my podcast, The Dennis Miller Option. It's on Westwood One. We will see you next time. Thank you, man. Appreciate your time. Thanks.